So um, your book, Leela, it's, it's such a fascinating book. I've taught it a few times. And in the short sort of scope of that book, the, the really slim volume that you produced, and I know that you've written an epilogue afterwards in, in the second edition, uh, you marshal such an array of the entire genealogy of, of, of post-colonialism. And so you have, on the one hand, you have uh, the, one may say, the kind of uh, early distant um, forefathers of uh, you know, post-colonial thought people like Franz Fanon and uh, your own great-grandfather, Mahatma Gandhi. And then you also have the entire tradition of um, postmodernism or post-structuralism, going back to Nietzsche, then coming forward through Heidegger, Foucault, Derrida, Lyotard, uh, Deleuze and Guattari. Uh, and then you have the Indian post-colonial thinkers, the subaltern thinkers, in, in, uh, uh, and, and uh, all of them. So you have uh, people like Partho Chatterjee, Gayatri Spivak, uh, Deepesh Chakraborty, uh, Gyanendra Pandey. So it's it's a really rich uh, sky full of uh, the, the the constellations of post-colonialism. Um, so so it's, it's difficult to do justice. But what I wanted to start with is one text that you repeat uh, repeatedly come back to a few times, and that is Spivak's text, "Can the Subaltern Speak." And it's a very interesting text because, as as you point out, it's uh, half serious, half parodic. Um, it's raising a question that that can't be answered in the sense of giving answers to, you know, what, what Deleuze would call a dogmatic image of thought. You know, that oh. you have a question and you have an answer. But uh, it is a, a question that she's um, engaging uh, from the viewpoint of a dialogue uh, to start with, with some of these thinkers themselves. She's referring to a conversation between Foucault and Deleuze, um, a conversation of friends, and she's critiquing it. Um, so the very idea that you also repeat a number of times in your book about the insurrection of subjugated knowledges that Foucault brings up, and the fact that that is grounded in his perception of, uh, in a way, the erosion of what we may call humanism taking place even as we speak at, in, in our times, um, or at, at least when he was writing it. Uh, so... Um, Spivak is uh, to some extent critical of that because she cannot take it for granted uh, to that extent. And uh, that the whole notion of uh, the, the, the discourse is already loaded. I mean, it isn't possible to speak uh, other than being co-opted by a discourse and a politics that already exists. So the question, can the subaltern speak, is, I think, a very important question in the heart of your work. And I wanted to also point to a few directions uh, that you've, you've uh, you know, excavated from people like, uh, yeah, to some extent, Foucault, but also Deleuze's, uh, Deleuze and Guattari's idea of minor literatures, uh, Heidegger's notion of a lictum. Um, and so I would, I'm wondering whether you'd like to talk a little bit about these directions uh, can, uh, 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 to answer the question, can the subaltern speak? And also refer a little bit to Gayatri's own work. I mean, can the subaltern speak is a text that actually does not really refer to what she is herself doing to help the subaltern to speak? And then your own ideas and views, Leela, about what you think about uh, a way out of this impasse of our times. Uh, Devashi said, thank you. That's so elegant and quite beyond, uh, 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 um, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 anything I can say, I I'm sure that uh, is uh, extremely um, eloquent uh, and enabling for me as well. Um, um, 
It's an interesting question, you know. Um, I think um, you know, I think again, just with some historical hindsight, um, that um, at least when I, I was working on that book, um, the um, the field of postcolonial studies, uh, uh, partly on account of its proximity uh, to um, to poststructuralism and to the tradition of critical theory as well, was very uh, very much taken up with um, the politics of knowledge. Um, you know, so that uh, in that uh, uh, grounding um, uh, in its in its uh, origins in the academy, um, the field is very much of a moment uh, in radical epistemology. Uh, um, and I don't know whether that interest still pertains today. Uh, you know, I, I think we are in the middle of uh, many debates about curricular reform. Uh, uh, so obviously this question of uh, knowledge and the management of knowledge remains important. But in the in the sphere of the academic preoccupation with social justice, um, um, it's very rare and charged the milieu in which um, Spivak Scan, the subaltern speak is uttered, where the question is really one of what happens to knowledge in the context of colonial encounter. <laughs> um, so um, the, the, the question then, I think, uh, the questions that inhabit Can the subaltern speak are really about um, uh, the limits of, or putting limits to what is knowable, putting limits to what is knowable, uh, and the ethics of uh, of that project. And, you know, besides uh, Spivak, I mean, someone else who I've spent more company with in later years is, is Truyo, uh, uh, the, you know, who, uh, as a historian of subjugated uh, knowledges, is very much asking us to be mindful of silences <laughs> and illusions. Um, um, and, and, you know, I, I think just to clarify that as the minimal content, you know, minimal in the philosophical sense, the irreducible preoccupation for Spivak in her milieu of uh, a radical epistemology. Uh, um, the, the, the question is, um, is not abstractly, uh, can the subaltern speak, can uh, minorities speak, or can subalt, can, can, you know, uh, uh, the wretched of the earth speak, <laughs> but whether they are knowable, um, and whether um, at the heart of a quest for epistemological representation, um, you know, a work we're all doing all the time, an unending work, um, whether we should not pause and ask ourselves uh, of the ethics of such a quest <laughs> and suspend the quest for knowledge as such at certain points. Um, um, so it's really about... Um, the moral hygiene of intellectual inquiry. <laughs> uh, um, uh, and I, I, I must say, um, I know the, the Vashish, the work you do, uh, and especially where you are situated, um, spiritual epistemologies are important, I know, uh, uh, to you. Uh, and uh, uh, Spivak is very much <laughs> 
heir to those spiritual epistemologies. She once said in a public uh, talk that I attended, and I was very moved by this, that some of the obfuscations and anxieties of Candace the subaltern speaker, because she was frightened. Uh, she was trying to introduce a new way of thinking in, 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 in a, a, a highly Eurocentric academy. And she had to display her P's and Q's, that she knew her Deleuze, she knew her Derrida, and that she's less frightened now. <laughs> she's less frightened now. And I think some of the things she conceals is the tradition from which um, uh, 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 there is in, in spiritual epistemology is the recommendation to, to still the mind, to not know. <laughs> um, uh, to stop the project of, of, of knowledge itself. And I think that is hidden in Spivak. <laughs> and she relies on post-structuralism for those moves. But she comes back to it in an essay that if if all of you haven't read or um, that I, I find fascinating, it's even more difficult to read than Candace of Walton speak, and that's her Moving Davy essay. It's a catalog essay for the exhibition of the Mother Goddess, where she, you know, she harnesses some of these spiritual um, uh, epistemologies or uh, recommendations to stop, to arrest, to arrest the quest for knowledge. Um, uh, so, uh, if that's that's one place to start, um, uh, certainly. Uh, uh. Um. <clears throat> I'll open it up. I think, I think if anybody wants to uh, join this conversation at this point, mm -hmm. um, you know, we could we could take it further, or I could move ahead a little more with this. Um, hello. I, I was Hi. I was just, I was just curious about. Um, what was the reaction of the academy uh, to Spivak's paper? I know you address that in the book. Also, you talk about it in quite some in quite some length. But I'm I'm just curious. In real practical terms, did uh, the subaltern actually find a voice since the time that it was written? How what how would you you know your thoughts on that? Right, right, uh, right. Um, uh, uh, you mean did it did it actually transform the world of which it was speaking? Hmm. Um, it's a really good question. Uh, you know, it's a really good question. Of course, there isn't any one subaltern. The status of the subaltern keeps changing. But you know, um, uh. You know what I've realized about academic work, uh, which I believe in, really believe in, is that it is important, not necessarily because um, it produces transformations on the ground, but because um, it catches and describes something that is happening. <laughs> You know, uh, that, I mean, in your own training in, in this vocation, Beruth, uh, Weber would uh, uh, call it, uh, it is a vocation, what you what you become sensitive to, it's a kind of wonderful thing. It's a, it's an optimism and a pessimism, you become alert to what is happening in the world in intangible ways. And you give it a certain sort of life. Mm. Uh, if you're very good at it, I mean, if you're very sincere, and I think Spivak is a very sincere thinker, and what she was doing along with the subaltern studies uh, historians uh, of India, you know, usually I like to say South Asia, especially these days, but they, they were very Indian historians, that they uh, they were doing something amazing, and it's not just about the subaltern, you know, it's... Um, um, if I could just take a few steps sideways, uh, always a good thing to do, uh, is um, that um, after Said's Orientalism, which uh, poses the problem of colonial encounter as uh, one of the European colonizer and the non-European colonized, 
The subaltern studies historians emerged on the scene and they wrote these works in the vein of post-colonial theory, but Europe was not, not their preoccupation. <laughs> uh, they saw the problem of colonial encounter as enacted within the post-colonial nation state um, by um, the elite state and the people, the people uh, and civil society. Uh, this is a really counterintuitive move. It's a move of self-critique, you know, something we must continue to learn of, uh, learn from in these times, that the problem isn't out there, it's at home. <laughs> and of course, this alertness came to uh, the subaltern studies group. They were politically, politically Maoist. <laughs> Uh, and they 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 gained their insights from this account of imperialism as something that happens ongoingly at home. You know, the writer Ashil Membe is very sensitive to this, that it's something that's happening on the ground. It isn't out there. Um, so, uh, you know, in the worlds in which this thought was occurring, basically, the post-colonial, uh, the, 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 the romance of anti-colonial nationalism had kind of failed, you know. Um, uh, the, the Asia and Africa were beset by dictatorships, by injustices of, of, of gender, of caste, of, um, of class, um, uh, sexuality, of course, so that emerged in consciousness later, but these injustices, uh, rich and poor, um, and by a certain malaise of power. <laughs> and, you know, in, in, in South Asia, the emergency years were an important uh, marker for this coming to awareness. So subalternity is always an account of um, uh, something that gets lost in the orthodox account of revolution, okay? Uh, and that's the interesting thing about subalternity, that it's not, the subaltern is not someone who is sidelined by power as such. The subaltern is someone who is sidelined by those who claim to be the true bearers of revolution. And in, in, in anti-colonial thought, the true bearers of revolution are the national elite, you know? Uh, so the subaltern is someone who doesn't doesn't make the cut. <laughs> um, when Spivak is sitting down to say, can the subaltern speak? She's asking a million questions. One of the things she is doing, to go back to where I started, is describing a movement that had already been fermenting and growing uh, in the worlds of which she was speaking. So, yes... The short answer is she gives life to the work that was already being done and she goes that step further, which is a really responsible academic thing to do, and declares that work unfinished. It just, and I have low battery, so I'm just going to... I've just learned that you can't keep your computer plugged all the time. As a result, I'm always running out of battery. So anyway. <laughs> so uh, to to uh, extend this a little bit, uh, even in terms of Deep's question, uh, and I, I touched on this question uh, in the uh, in the earlier framing, um, Swivak's own work, for example, with the Adivasis. Yes. Uh, or if we think about, I mean, a, a more well-known precursor, Paulo Freire's work with the pedagogy of the oppressed. Okay. Um, one of the things that, and, and I, I, I'd also like to, you know, draw attention to Dipesh Chakrabarti's discussion of uh, the way in which even the subaltern group uh, represents, say, Birsa Munda's uh, revolution, uh, you know, because to some extent, there is a Marxist reduction that's taking place. I mean, the, their the subaltern is not being able to speak because the subaltern is saying there that I was getting my knowledge from Thakur. Uh, you know, I was being guided by Thakur. And they say, well, that's just a kind of a way of justifying the fact that he's trying to, uh, you know, mobilize his people. 
but uh, but that's not true because that is actually what this person is experiencing. The subaltern is speaking in his own tongue, right? But uh, is getting in a way, um, you know, changed into something else that is, uh, you know, being able to justify the movement in a larger frame. So I, my one of my thoughts there is the question of. Uh, of course, as you said, listening very carefully to those lapses of translation, uh, okay. where we are not being able to translate, we, we distort, and it's, it's what they call epistemic violence is being committed, even with all uh, you know good intention, uh, because we are not being able to translate the frame from which it is coming. Uh, so. Uh, to some extent, on the other hand, when, when we even look back at, uh, say, the history of India, and, you know, there's a lot of talk now about uh, how, for example, the, you know, the matrilineal or the matristic uh, traditions were um, subjugated by the more patriarchal traditions, etc., which is true, some of that has happened, but there is also synthesis, there's also more complexity at the borders. Right. There, yeah, so uh, the transformations of these systems uh, are very complex to really, and they, nothing remains the same. Things do change over time, uh, but the question really, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm just bringing it back to her own work uh, with the Adivasis, for example, um, what would you say about giving the subaltern a voice by carefully listening to the subaltern and the possibility of creative languages emerging that cannot be made by us. They have to be made by the people who right. need to come into the world. What right. do you think about that? Devashi, you are so right in guiding our attention to uh, uh, Spivak's, you know, um, a really visionary uh, um, eye on the problem of the Adivasi, you know, that again in these times that now we have become alert to questions of indigeneity. Um, and uh, she is, you know, an early, early, uh, is, is, a, is, one, is a pioneer. Uh, uh, in 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 um, uh, making that figure <laughs> um, uh, something to be reckoned with, you know. Uh, so um, and uh, uh, you know, it's a it's a it's a passage to her again, uh, very preemptive early thinking on planetarity and on the resources of um, of of the Adivasi. Um, absolutely, absolutely. You know, she is uh, ex exactly. You know, um, um, uh, the 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 the. the that she's urging us to listen. And I think very much um, what you are getting at um, in your questions about translation um, are all important here, you know, and again, um, um, to speak to them out of the, the, the context of, you call it a Marxist reduction uh, beautifully. Um, and I uh, was speaking earlier of um, uh, sort of, the authorized language of revolution, <laughs> um, you know, uh, as uh, as as a, as as keen as keen to the idea uh, to the problem of Marxist reduction. So that one of the problems is um, is 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 to say uh, is to make the voice of the uh, indigene of the Adivasis uh, to translate it into some some system of revolution, you know, as an example of uh, a proletarian revolution, for example, or as an example of anti-Anthropocene thinking, um, uh, whereas it may be doing something quite different that may derail the, the, the revolutionary project. So that to suspend the temptation for reduction, uh, to be open to something that will throw a spanner in the works of what you think is radical or progressive. I mean, that's the hard thing. Uh, uh... Yes, absolutely, Leela. This also where, you know, again, in, in Deepesh, Deepesh's book, Provincializing Europe, where he's asking the question, can, can we even have another teleology of our own? Right. It's, 
we have to accept the teleology and then, uh, as it were, translate our own uh, systems to, to those terms uh, to some extent. Uh, of course, that's where, uh, you know, again, coming back to uh, what you're drawing attention to, uh, the notion of minor languages, minor literatures, um, you know, uh, comes in as a possibility. But along with the caveat of marginality studies, which you also raise in your book, marginality studies can so easily become a way of normalizing, uh, you know, these kind of epistemologies within the establishment, Absolutely. so that they lose their bite, as it were. They just yes, become indeed. another, you know, kind of province of the of the exotic, so to say. Indeed, uh, indeed. Yeah, but but uh, how would you think about the difference between minor literatures and minority studies in this sense? Huh. Um. Um, um, it's a good question, a hard question, uh, 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 you know, um, um, again, without polemicizing, you know, minority studies, when you say minority, so many things come to mind, um, the vexed figure of the minority uh, uh, politically, uh, you know, uh, in Arendt's thought, um, you know, um, uh, and the question of uh, uh, the 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 problem with minority. I think for someone like Arendt is uh, that it um, it is always posited by a majority uh, that minority studies are kind of majority studies. Uh, um, and uh, uh, the problem with designating minorities uh, um, is, is, you know, minority in relation to whom? Uh, um, and, uh, 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 but of course, important work gets done, you know, provisional work uh, gets done under the rubric of minority studies. Um, but um, I find m minor is a, is a very interesting uh, respite uh, from the problem of minority, um, and I have uh, thought of uh, of minor not numerically uh, because a minority is a is a kind of um, mathemat mathematical uh, quality, uh, um, which gets us into this problem of sums, total, part, constituent, subpart, subdivision, a high a mathematical hierarchy. A mathematical hierarchy, whereas minor is something that, of course, Deleuze and Guattari talk about. But I find I I I I am able to think of it most productively through musicology, uh, of uh, of minor as a kind of note uh, um, uh, that uh, is is wonderful. You know, it produces a feeling of unease, <laughs> of unsettlement. Uh, it doesn't, uh, it is always that uh, um, sort of gadfly in the Socratic uh, sense to the symphony. It produces a, uh, imperfect, it is imperfective, it is unfinished. Um, but it's also musically, you know, uh, I, uh, you know, musicologists say of the minor, the major key, that when you hear the major key, you just hear the major key. That's all you hear. It fills your ears. It makes you feel calm and happy and safe. Um, whereas when you hear the minor key, the reason why it's unsettling is because you can hear all the other notes in it. <laughs> it allows them to come through. Uh, so um, those are, uh, you know, in that way, the minor liberates something uh, that that minority doesn't, <laughs> you know, it points to a kind of affective work. Uh, and by that token, anyone can be minor, anyone can strike a minor key by themselves with others, but it is always to summon an unfinished assemblage and unfinished. That is all that minor does. Uh, everything that is there, and because of that impossibility, it cannot be finished. It cannot be rounded up. Uh, so 
um, that's a sort of that's beautiful. That's really beautiful, Leela. I think, uh, yeah, absolutely. You know, in, in that that marks such a uh, crucial difference between the you know minoritarian and the minor. Uh, I'd, I'd say yes. Uh, I think he also they were also talking about um, minor literatures or minor ways of being. Um, as as uh, the creation of new concepts that can insert themselves, uh, you know that that can have a political force in that sense that uh, are unsettling. Uh, there, like you said, that there is an there is an unsettled quantity or quality to them, and that they are unfinished in that sense that they're in movement, they're constantly engaged, uh, you know, within themselves as well as with the with the outside. So, uh, absolutely, I, yeah. yes. And I mean, you know, in a sense, I think uh, Spivak's subaltern is really a, a figure of the minor, uh, you know, that it's a figure of irresolution, a figure of irresolution that she holds on to and returns to by many names. Yes. So, so uh, uh, speaking for uh, one of our uh, students, the one I was telling you about who couldn't be here, uh, the one from Oroville, uh, this actually, I mean, not maybe not everybody can resonate with it, but he gave us this question, so I want to ask it. And it's related to your second chapter in, in your book, where you're referring to Lyotard, and uh, you know, very, very, very important sort of moment in post-structuralist and post-modern thinking, where Lyotard is talking about co conversational imperialism and radical dissensus, and he's interposing that against uh, the whole assumption of a consensus that uh, you know the Enlightenment is is producing, that we are all are all moving towards this one view this age of the world picture, if, as Heidegger calls it. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So um, instead, it's time for us to experience radical dissensus. And um, the other side of it, which the student is asking, because he actually lives in what one might call a minor community, Oroville, mm -hmm. is, um, however, we are also looking for a kind of consensus. Uh, we we believe in the politics of consensus is what he's saying. So he's saying, how would you differentiate between this, um, you know, search for radical dissensus with a minor politics of consensus? Can such a thing exist? And is it framed by metaphysical assumptions? That's a great question. It's a great question, you know. Um, I mean, it happens, you know, it's a great question. And again, to break it down, I mean, it happens in, in minimally, you know, I like, uh, uh, you know, uh, for, for uh, Levinas, uh, a, a community just needs um, two, one plus one. Uh, because in Levinas's, I mean, Levinas's theology, there is always God. So there's always a third. Uh, so you always assume that you have a spare one somewhere uh, and uh, two is not enough to constitute a community you need but you can be one plus one and then there's this third it could be the divine it could be whatever force or goodwill goodwill rationality even there's always this plus one and i i think that in in those situations as well that one has to and here i'm moving from the post-structuralist tradition to the Rawlsian uh, 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 where you need to agree on things, you know, in order to get things done. If you live in a community, you have to reach agreement um, uh, uh, just to live, to live well. Um, um, but, you know, um, I don't know that consensus is the only term uh, we have, uh, you know, in the community from which your student comes, for example, uh, there is another word for consensus, and that's harmony. Um, uh, and it's a very good word. <laughs> it's not as kind of uh, uh, sexy as consensus, <laughs> but it's a good word. 
uh, you know, um, and I was actually reading uh, Amartya Sen's book, Home in the World, uh, uh, this morning, and Sen is really good. You know, Sen actually takes so much of his cues from the Buddhist Sangha. Uh, not dissimilar to the Oroville community, um, where you have to do things together, you have to decide, listen, you're a wandering, you are individual wanderers, individually peripatetic, and you've come to a com peripatetic community. This is a mess. Now you're all peripatetic, uh, but you have agreed to move together. <laughs> and so you have to agree uh, when to do that, you know, practically. Um, so there has to be some minimal agreement. Um, uh, and that is the work of harmony. Uh, uh, that is the work of harmony. Uh, and that just belongs to lived experience uh, where you say you compromise, you, you agree, you suspend, you suspend yourself. Um, and it's very important, but it's another skill set. It's another skill set and another training. Um, um, uh, I think what Sen also gives us as a way to understand or maybe harmonize harmony and consensus are other terms and other models. You know, consensus is something that comes out of the, also the kind of hubris of the public sphere that, uh, uh, um, you know, European secularism thinks it's invented. It's invented the public sphere. Uh, and then in, in the imperial adventure, what, what it does is to deny the public sphere. Uh, 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 to 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 the colonized uh, because they are not ready for it. Uh, uh, so it cons invents the public sphere, and then suspends it because it's not fully uh, because the the populations where it is being suspended are not fully capable of the public sphere. So they are not capable of consensus, and so they can't be given the right to have consensus. So consensus has a fraught history in the in the genealogy of European liberalism. But what Sen does by going back to these early examples, actually very pertinently to your student in Oroville, the Sangha, other such groups, is to say, well, you don't have consensus necessarily always, but the way you can function is through uh, something that he calls communicative interaction. Uh, and uh, keep talking, <laughs> keep talking. Uh, 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 that you keep negotiating uh, with others, that you can't, um, you know, the idea of consensus has become an a priori, so a kind of very despotic individual can claim to understand what consensus is. Um, but communicative interaction and other such terms belong to uh, a, a more democratic outlook where all you have, all you have is a commitment to dynamically uh, interact and communicate, and in the hope that you'll muddle through, you'll muddle through. Uh, it won't be perfect. You won't have realized a public sphere. It doesn't matter whether you realize the public sphere or not, but you'll have moved together safely and with minimal quarreling. Um, and then you try again. So you have to keep inventing it. All you have is not the outcome, but a method that more or less works more or less works. And there is something uh, not as elegant as the model of public sphere and consensus, but something sort of very livable <laughs> and enabling and flexible. Uh, Thank you. Yes, yes, Leel. I think, uh, yeah, I think you make a very important point, uh, which has to do with consensus and I think a matter of semantics and, you know, fixing these terms. Uh, consensus, as when he's talking about consensus politics, it's definitely not the consensus that we are looking at uh, when, you know, the Enlightenment is talking about uh, one, you know, sort of knowledge uh, that we all arrive at or that we must agree with because that there is only that one knowledge. But I think what I really find, um, you know, valuable in what you said is this notion of movement. Um, and I think when they're talking, and harmony, you, you mentioned harmony, but I think they also do use the word consensus politics for another kind of thing, which is related to movement. Because <laughs> under certain circumstances, in the here and now, uh, given, you know, there can be a politics of alliance that you've talked beautifully about in your other work, 
uh, where we see together that something is the best for, uh, for us all. Uh, and and that's the consensus. It's it includes renunciation at that point. It's yes, yes. You have to put the whole before the part to be able to see that kind of uh, consensus in movement. You know, for yes. for the here and it can only be again a, a kind of a minor consensus in that sense. Yes, but, yes, beautiful. Yeah, beautiful. So I, I I think that's wonderful. Yeah, that mm -hmm. distinction. No, that's beautiful. Thank you, Alpika, for your uh, your comment. Uh, so I think since there's not that much time left, I would really request any of you to come forward with your questions. Some of you have already addressed your questions um, in writing. So if you could come forward and speak them, it'll be good. I see Com McKendrew with his hand up. So Com, please. Uh, and then Jordi. Yes. Yes, I would, while listening, I constantly find myself uh, wondering if we, if one example of the quest for consensus might be found in, like, uh, Lily mentioned music. You know, a jazz, yes. I think, is an improvisational yes. kind of music. And, and it's yes. never perfect, but it's always throwing out, picking up ideas that can be used by the larger community you know, in a quest for consensus between opposites. Beautiful. Thank you, thank you. That's, that's how I have been understanding. I think that's beautiful, you know, and I think what you've got at Colm, if I may, you've helped me. I've been trying to puzzle with what a performance is, you know, and I think uh, I think this question of performance is all important here. I mean, in a in a, in yes. a funny way, you know, because mm -hmm. when you perform, you're making something happen, but not once yes. and for all. And you are doing it with others. You're doing it with others, you know, always. Um, and it's something dynamic again, moving. Uh, I, I think this uh, improvisational jazz is, you know, and in, in the Indic tradition, you know, uh, Hindustani classical music follows that improvisational view that you, you know, where uh, the, the question of consensus is, of course, with others, but also within the musicality of the notes available to you. Uh, you have to make them uh, enter into some sort of conversation so that there yes. is, you know, one might call it a, what you put your finger on is the importance of a milieu of conversation and improvisation, you know, where mm -hmm. the agents are human and non-human, um, material and immaterial, uh, uh, instruments, notes, audiences, performers. It's beautiful. So enabling. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. I thank you. Jordi. Jordi, yeah. You're still muted, Jody. Okay, got it. Uh, yeah, what a pleasure um, that you're here, Leela. Thank you so much for joining us. I, um, I uh, first of all, just to say, I love this um, idea of music and and uh, and the minor, and you know, it just um, it really resonates with me. Moving out of that sort of quantifying, you know, minority, which is like a number of people into something a bit more uh, uh, qualitative. Um, uh -huh. So that really, it really resonates. Um, I just had a quick question because um, uh, John Rawls has always inspired me um, in terms of the foundations of liberal political philosophy. And uh, I wanted to bring up the name of um, Susan Mahler Oaken, who, uh -huh. Um, was a feminist philosopher um, that wrote a book. I think it's called Justice, Ge uh, Gender, and um, uh, let me see. Um, sorry, it's it, it, she wrote a wonderful book that I read for a class in college in undergraduate, and I was wondering if you um, had... Uh, were familiar with her and could no, know. I sounds like some someone up my tree. Uh, definitely, definitely, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think me? um, 
it, mm -hmm. from my perspective, John Rawls has a wonderful theory of how to arrive at a just, fair and just society. And he's also coming from a, you know, very, um, um, uh, I guess for lack of a better word, uh, uh, Western perspective, you know, as a Harvard professor in the seventies, you know, um, so uh, Susan Mahler Oaken really takes his ideas and says, look, you know, you're, you have blind spots. You're coming from this uh, kind of uh, white guy perspective. Here's from uh, the, the female perspective. Amazing. So, uh, I, yeah. I, I thought if you, um, if you're familiar that then maybe it would be interesting to hear you talk about, but. I'll just, follow up yeah, on it. I, I, uh, thank you for, 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 for teaching me to, to, to look there. That's uh, very valuable. Uh, thank you. So Marina. Hi everyone, I just want to say thank you for, you know, you being here. It's an absolute a treat. And um, I want to follow up on the previous question regarding the feminist, um, you know, philosophies. And I teach feminism to uh, high school students right now. And just two days ago, <laughs> they had an activity where they had to create a motto and a poster for a fifth wave of feminism, basically what is feminism for generation you know, Z and how do they envision it going forward? And what I've noticed that the majority of the groups were really highly focused on the right to education. Right. And with all that we're discussing in this class, it brings up very interesting conundrum which is two-sided so one is now that we're talking about education and what goes into it right and the politics of knowledge yeah. right so you know how does that play out in a post-colonial discourse and children really ready to fight for the right of education like what kind of education are they fighting for and two um after reading your book i was just kind of getting worried about the whole perception of the feminism itself representing western value mm -hmm. system yeah. so how do you see it play out in like so if if the world is seeing feminism is the western idea then how would we structure the dialogue around all this? Yeah, no, this is such wonderful and important questions, uh, uh, Marina, really. Uh, um, I, I, you know, I mean, actually here's something you, you know, you could teach me more about it since you, 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 you really do a kind of uh, um, a lived interaction uh, with, with people for whom these are burning questions. I mean, for my part, you know, I, 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 I don't mind that something is Western or not Western. You know, it's like if I go back to the kind of questions that Jordi, the the Jordi's communication or conversation was really about, you know, here is roles, there are blind spots, then someone uh, it once it's put in circulation freely as look, this is what I've got. I know I have blind spots. Then someone else comes along and critiques it. So long as there is a kind of adaptive milieu. You know, we'll never find, I suppose that is what Spivak is saying in Can the Subaltern Speak is that, you know, give up the quest for something uh, unadulterated and pure and impeccable. Um, mm -hmm. uh, it, it just, just you know, strive for a milieu of, of transformation. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, again, movement and interaction so that it doesn't matter if feminism has European uh, uh, or Western associations or even blind spots mm -hmm. you know so long as it is available to transformation it's okay you know like white supremacy isn't available to transformation uh religious fundamentalism you know or, of anywhere including where i come from is not available for transformation there are mm -hmm. some philosophies that are not available to transformation but others that are take those and run i mean you know that's at least that, that's certainly the way I've operated. You know, otherwise I would feel so bad about working with Deleuze and Foucault. Foucault is so Eurocentric. I mean, deeply Eurocentric, not only Eurocentric, Francocentric. I mean, his entire, he populates the world with examples from, you know, from France, but it's generative thought. It's transformative, it's transformable, it's transformable. So 
uh, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> beautiful. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. That that was a beautiful, uh, you know, response, Dila. That really wonderful. I think Jonathan has a question. Hi, Jonathan. Hi. Yeah, it, it's great uh, conversation, and you happen to hit a couple uh, nodes in my own life, jazz and classical Indian music, actually. And, <laughs> and um, lucky you. <laughs> yeah, there's a definitely a, a long and interesting. Um, story behind cultivating a kind of a dialogue conversation behind that but I guess my question has to do with with that kind of the problems of cross-cultural translation but also the task of overcoming a, any kind of a centrism which is going to keep the other as as always an outside you know and so in terms of um sitting and and talking and the conceptual idea of generating like in conversation right um that's one way um, but sitting down with another and really engaging in a, a kind of like a co-creative space, like Debashish was also bringing up, like the idea we need to generate with the other, we need to sit with them, we need to become minor with them, not just identify as minor. I'm speaking from my own maybe positionality here. Wonderful. You know, and um, I guess I, I also wanted to just bring up like uh, what, when you were speaking about the minor. Um, I, I'm hearing that so much from the, the blues, like Cornell West speaks oh, so poetically about the blue note, which is really that, the, that, that note that is really, it's, it kind of avoids capture from musicology in a way because it, it is actually a partial that doesn't fit into an easily capturable um, a musical analog uh, analysis in a way. So it kind Absolutely. of like it breaks the 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 ways in which musicology will will kind of center like let's say uh tonality or and whatnot so i love how you're bringing out the minor as not not just like i would say i have problems with like a eurocentric musicology to to talk about let's say the minor but when we get into cross-cultural dialogue and bringing in african-american blues music and think raga music it adds so much to the to the conversation um as well but anyway <laughs> getting to my question is more like um, how how do you see psychological like the, from a psychological perspective the requirement to engage in transformation in which is going to put in, into question one's own epistemolo epistemological assumptions and ontological container? Um, that's something that came up in my life as I was sitting in India learning raga music. It seemed to me that I couldn't just sit and just be an outsider and take this in. And, and synthesize it according to my own sensibilities and my own logics um, that I grew up with. And so in terms of like becoming minor in a community and, and being in like a minor performance with others, that, that kind of co-creative space and that experimental space, which you really have to embark upon the unknown of what, what is it that's going to emerge here um, and the ethical ways in which that can kind of co-emerge rather than be subjugating one to your idea of what should emerge, you know? And so I just, I guess it's really a, a question of like, how much do we need to be conscious of that, that praxis, which is psychological in nature, which can help address these kind of, these kind of uh, the unthought within the ontological sense of knowing ourselves. Oh, Jonathan, those are such a real and beautiful questions, really. I'm very moved uh, to hear from you. And, uh, you know, I, I don't have a further answer. I just want to thank you uh, and uh, for, for sharing those thoughts. And as you were talking, I was reminded of something, uh, a word uh, very dear to my heart that Devashish brought up earlier, and that's renunciation. And I think hearing, it's been, you know, in my mind, and then hearing you speak, I think maybe what we're all starting to talk about is um, in these practices of the minor and of communicative interaction and movement is something um, that's not always available uh, in common sense. And that's the, 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 the sheer joyfulness of renunciatory practice uh, of, uh, you know, and th that true joy is, 
impossible without terror in the way that you know even the Kantian uh, experience of the sublime has to do with some complete desertification of everything you know that it's only then when you say I am terrified that you feel uh, you experience the sublime and that uh, in a in a sense what you're talking about in, in in every interaction in the quest for the minor there is something renunciatory you're giving something up that's not easy it's painful it's un uncomfortable it's more than that it's panic inducing it produces anxiety uh, but it is the mm, prelude to something very joyful uh, which you cannot predict uh, but that you know what's possible I think in this kind of renunciatory practice of the minor is that to be able to return to your question about the psychological to be able to see in our terror apropos the sublime and anxiety apropos renunciation some auguring of joy some auguring of joy uh, so thank you so much yeah this is very very musical your your thought and your writing is it's always been musical to me but this is so beautiful oh, thank you Jonathan. you're so kind Dave Deep, I think yes Yes, I, I have a, a quick comment and then my question. I just wanted to thank you for writing this book. So in our course, we've been reading a lot of texts. And uh, very honestly, not all the reading is uh, you know, very easy at first because we're not used to uh, the approach of the language. But your book really helps to put it all together and give it a kind of cohesive sense and direction. So thank you for that. Um, my, my question is, uh, you were talking earlier about um, you know, about the subaltern, about nationalism and the elite, and uh, also the, the 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 disappointment how the how the nationalist project kind of was no longer attractive in a certain sense. And I'm just curious about the fact that over the last say 75, 80 years of uh, decolonization, in a certain sense, um, there is a kind of return of a hyper nationalism in various various parts of the world and i i wonder how you would what would be the sort of post colonial response to this uh resurgence of identity politics would you see that as could we see that as something that is a voice that is emerging from the ground or would we i mean i i'm just trying to situate the mm. modern trends of political movements in India and other parts of the world in the light of post-colonial theory. Right, right. This is such an important question, you know, such an important, crucial question. All I have to say is don't stop asking it. Uh, you know, don't stop asking it. It's really important. I mean, what terrifies me is when people stop asking that question and stop being troubled by it. You must be constantly troubled by it. And, you know, what is the post-colonial response to it? You know, the, the complication, the leap is, uh, is populism. Uh, you know, um, when, when um, one finds it. But what post-colonial theory, you see, what it does is ultimately it... <clears throat> <clears throat> it's very historical, but it, um, you know, just as, say, Foucault gave us the idea of governmentality, uh, you know, a certain kind of modern organization of power, that if postcolonial theory has an enduring appeal, it's the account of imperialism as a certain structure of power, you know, uh, that is intolerant of difference intolerant of difference that requires the same that requires homogeneity uh, and that is erasing of difference you know this is an old idea but it it clarifies it builds on governmentality it gives this second veneer so what that makes of imperialism is a modular concept of power and you know a post-colonial critique. So therefore, post-colonialism is always critical of nationalisms that behave like imperialisms. Uh, to be post-colonialist, you don't have to restrict your critique to Europe. That's, you know, because Europe has some wonderful things about it. Um, you know, it's to a structure of power. It's to a structure, to the instrumentalizing erasure of difference yeah so that you keep 
you know, so that what that which is a difference in minority populations, gender differentials, you keep, you know, it's not like it's not like genocide. You can't destroy those. Genocide is another structure of power. You keep those alive, those populations alive, but Ashil Membe says this in a state of injury in a state of injury so that you can instrumentalize them. You know, you still need the labor, you still need the, um, the functionality of these populations, but you keep them alive in a state of injury. When you see that happening, it's empire, it's empire. And you just ask the question that you have asked me of it relentlessly. So you can say in, in the context of domestic violence, this is imperialism. Uh, in in the context of queer bashing, this is imperialism. You know that there are all kinds of imperialisms: religious fundamentalism, you know, resurgent, aggressive, selective hatred, nationalism is an imperialism, and you use all the tools of anti-imperialism available to you: disobedience, no saying, um, exemption, renunciation, running away, <laughs> non-participation, strike. <laughs> Silence, all those things, non-cooperation, mutual aid. So it's oh, a wonderful, <laughs> wonderful, wonderful answer, Leela. I, I was thinking actually even related to this, you, you bring it up in your book, how the moment of nationalism actually brings up so many voices and tries to articulate a difference uh, in a new way, which is very creative and plural, uh, but there, what unites it is a common enemy. And once the yeah. enemy is gone, there's often this same kind of can the subaltern speak moment when there is an appropriation, one enters into the norm, the molds of, of the imperial state. Right. And, yeah, and then the difference becomes imperialized. And beautiful, Sebastian. That is beautiful. The difference becomes imperialized. That's beautiful. Yeah, and that's in a way what we are seeing today in a lot of places. It's 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 a wave where all these differences are becoming imperialized, and they they've emerged out of the single view of 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 the of the Western uh, Enlightenment, but they are becoming their own kinds of uh, imperial formations. Uh, which, which is very frightening. Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. Well. <laughs> thank you so much, Leela. I mean, that this is this has been, I mean, the one hour has just flown like that. It, it, uh -huh. It's as if, you know, uh, but, uh -huh. but it's wonderful, wonderful talking to you. And I wish we had more time. And hopefully we'll have more opportunity to meet and discuss uh, some of this group will be actually in Oroville uh, in summer, and hopefully, um, if you're there, we might be able to meet briefly at least uh, once again. Of course. Thank you for your really beautiful conversation. I've learned so much, and it's been such a pleasure. Thank you for having me, Devashish. Thank, so you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.